Welcome online family, we're glad you're here. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of our content. Also, head over to the App Store and download our TFBC app where you can check out all of our events. You can leave prayer requests for us. You can also follow our sermon notes as we give the message each week. Speaking of messages, we got a great one for you today. So let's dive right in. Good morning. As we travel down this road through Romans, I'm super stoked to preach on Romans chapter 3, 21 to 26. So I um, apologize that the notes aren't going to be there for you. So if you want to do it old school, you open your Bibles and take a pen and just scribble all in the columns and the margins and everywhere. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Uh, I'll try to spell some of the bigger words because I am going to use some of the big Bible words today. Um, so I'll, I will apologize for that and beforehand. Um, man, Bob has laid this out for us very well as we've led to chapter 3, um, talking about our, our sin, talking about the Jews and the Gentiles and how Paul is writing to both groups and trying to bring them together. And today he culminates that around what Christ has done. So chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Romans, uh, the first part of chapter 3, uh, they all focus on the condemnation, on the wrath of God, and, and how that is being revealed to mankind. And, and, and remember, this was written in the first century, so it's not like things are really bad now. They've been really bad for a long time, because the wrath of God has been being revealed uh, since the beginning of time, since Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, so it's, it's being revealed in, in the end of chapter 3, is which we're going to deal with today. But then in chapter 4... Uh, chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3, we deal with the justification through faith, how we are justified. How can we celebrate Easter next week as sinners? You ever think about that? Like you walk in, I, how many of you have ever thought, maybe even before you came to Christ or even sometimes even now, you think, man, I, I don't want to go to church today. The building might fall in on me, right? So that's where we are, that we, we need that justification. Chapter 4, next, uh, in a couple of weeks we'll, after Easter, we'll come back and look at chapter 4 and Abraham's uh, saving faith, how that's explained. Uh, it kind of picks up from here in chapter 3. And then in chapter 5, we talk about the security gained, that our faith is uh, what saves us, but it's also what maintains that. It's just faith, uh, which is really hard for humans to, to wrap their minds around and, and get a hold of. So we're going to look at all that. So this passage might be best described as um, the explanation that Paul has for what Christ accomplished. How are we saved? How does that, what does that look like? What's the best way to explain it? And remember, a lot of his audience would, would be thinking of it from an Old Testament standpoint, and some of his new audience, the Gentiles, would be looking at it from a, just a, uh, a different ideology because they're all coming out of different weird religions. And all religions, and again, this hasn't changed since the first century either. Every religion in the world has man trying to become God. Or has man trying to climb the mountain to get to God. And it's all based on what man can do. Man would not, in and of himself, create this religion, Christianity. He would not. Matter of fact, that's what makes Christianity more offensive than anything is that this text will teach us that there is nothing, absolutely nothing you can do to be right before God. It's good luck. You can climb the mountain. I think Jeremy said it last week. You, if you were jumping from L.A. or wherever you, whatever the closest route to Hawaii is, if you were trying to jump the ocean to get there, good luck. Not going to happen. Bob showed it when he showed us the scales. It doesn't matter how many good things you do, the sin is always going to outweigh your goodness because you are not good enough. Take your finger, point it at yourself, and go, you are not good enough. Now do that. Do that. Really, go ahead. 
I'm not good enough. I'll just point at you then. You're not good enough. (laughs) But neither am I. It's the basics. This is the basics. It's Mark's madness. He's no longer coaching, but if he was coaching, he'd be in the final four. San Diego's going, so local team for us, I guess, as local as it gets. But John Wooten, the UCLA coach, forever was the ideal coach. And every recruiting class that he would bring in to his basketball team, you know what the first thing he taught them to do was? This is how you put your socks on. Seriously. And this is how you lace up your shoes. Because he knew that socks and shoes were probably more important than anything else that his players could do correctly. If they understood how to put their socks on and how to lace up their shoes, then he could teach them the rest. That was John Wooden. And that's literally what he taught his students, his players. So, that's my only cultural reference today. So, because it's March Madness. I try to pull it in somehow. All right, let's jump into the passage. Verse 21, we're just going to go right, we're going to trust through this because it's going to take a while, but it, there's some good stuff in here. It, we're going to like uh, be miners today, and we're just going to mine the truth out of this. Uh, but now apart from the law, again, we're condemned because of the law. The law condemns us. It says we're, we're not going to be able to be good enough. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets that's the f- Interesting that Paul uses that language. Apart from the law, but by the law, it's going to testify, right? So let's, let's dig into that. Apart from the law, man cannot appeal to the law for salvation. We cannot look and say, I can do this. If I just keep the Ten Commandments, I can do this. But because of what Jesus said in his sermon, if you lust after a woman in your heart... You've already committed adultery. What Jesus did was he raised the bar because the people would say, well, I've never committed adultery. And Jesus said, yeah, you have. If you've done it in your heart, you've already committed it. If you've had anger towards another person, guess what? You're a murderer. This was the bar that Jesus set. He explained the law to them because they were all just saying, well, I'm not doing those ten things, so I'm perfect. The rich young ruler who came to him said, what what do I need to be saved? And he's like, What does the Bible say? And he says, well, I I keep the Ten Commandments. And he starts listing them off. And Jesus says, well, you've missed a few. Take all your possessions and sell them and give them to the poor. And the guy walks away sad because he can't do that because he's broken law number one. Have no other gods before you. And his God was his money. So Paul is just extrapolating here what Jesus has already taught. Man cannot appeal to the law for salvation, yet... This is where man loves to point. I I can do this. I, me, what I can do. Again, all religions are based on this. Any cult out there that tells you that you can become God or that you can be good enough or that you can sin enough that God can't save you, that's all man religion. Man loves to create those types of religions, those type of systems that can make them look good. Put them in charge. Let them tell you how you have to live. That's man-made religion. That is not what Paul is talking about here. You cannot appeal to the law and be saved. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God. To enter heaven, we have to have the righteousness of God. What does that mean? It means you have to be as good as God. That's you. Raise your hand. Nobody? No takers? No, because we're not as good as God. But you have to be as good as God to get into heaven. No spot, no blemish. This is why the Old Testament is wonderful and always points to Christ. They used to take the the perfect lambs, the ones with no spot and no blemish, and they'd throw them up on the sacrificial table, and they would cut them so that they might bleed because blood had to be spilled for atonement for the sins of the people, and every year they would do this. And so as we talk about righteousness No spot, no blemish, no sin. You can have no sin. The Puritans used to say it like this. The righteousness that is God's righteousness requires is the righteousness of God. You get the redundancy there? 
If that's you, then go live by the law. Paul will say later, if you want to live by law, go for it. Jump to Hawaii, right? Go do enough good things that your sin is going to be outweighed by your good things. Good luck. He goes on to say, apart from the law, God's wrath has been revealed. We can see the future. Without salvation, there is wrath. And that's being revealed. Paul, Bob did a great job explaining that to us. That the wrath of God that's being revealed is that God gives you over to your own sinful desires. Romans chapter 1. That is the wrath of God that he's just finally going, you want to live this life? Live away. Go ahead. The wrath of God's also being revealed by his law. So you want to, you want to justify yourself by the law? Go ahead. Good luck. God, however, provides his eternal son, the perfect life the spotless lamb, he lives a righteous life, and yet he will take the wrath of God on the cross. Jesus experiences the wrath of God so that we don't have to. This is such a wonderful gospel that man does not believe it. The message of the cross, Paul will say later, is foolishness to those who are perishing. They don't believe it. It can't be that easy. It can't just be me saying, thank you, Jesus, for your death on the cross. It's got to be more. I have to do more. And Paul says, no, you don't. It's such a wonderful doctrine that people don't believe it. And the other side of that is when we do tell people, they're offended. Isn't that crazy? We simply tell people, you just need to put your faith in Jesus, and and you get eternal life. You get forgiven. And people are offended by that. Why? I don't like that. Why is it only through Jesus? Because it's only through Jesus. Right? We live in a world that's like, ah, I want it to be through everybody. That's the broad road. That's also the man-made road. If I can do it by myself, I don't need Jesus. If I can do it through Buddha, I don't need Jesus. If I can do it through Confucius, I don't need Jesus. But we need Jesus because Jesus was the perfect lamb. He is the righteousness of God revealed to us. Apart from the law, righteousness of God has been made known. That's Jesus. Oddly enough, it says through which the law and prophets testify. Well, how did the law and prophets testify? You guys remember the story of the disciples following Jesus to the, we we call it the Mount of Transfiguration. They go up to the mountain and all of a sudden he's glowing and he's bright. Does anybody remember who met him on that mountain? Elijah and Moses. Moses is the law. Elijah is the prophets. Is God's word not astounding? That's why this text is so precious to Christians. If you could tear out any piece, uh, any page out of your Bible, which... I don't know if some people get nervous about that, but if you could, if we were in a country where um, people banned books, I don't know if that happens in our country, um, but the Bible might be one of those books that they might ban at some point because there's some disturbing things, and not, uh, not to mention that it says there's only one way to heaven and people really hate that, so they want, they've always wanted to ban this book. But if that ever happened, or if you lived in China where it's illegal to have this book, this the Word of God. There's the, the, there's the uh, Chinese-approved book that, that takes a lot of this stuff out. But anyway, take this page out. If you want to memorize any scripture, memorize the, this paragraph because it is the central gospel because Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets. Let's keep going. i got to hurry. we got a second service today. All right, the righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how good you are, Jew. It doesn't matter how bad you are, Gentile. It doesn't matter. We all come to Christ. There is no difference. The righteousness of God is given through faith in Jesus. Faith is what you do When you can do nothing. Let me say that again. Faith is what you can do when you can do nothing. There is no thing you can do to earn your salvation. There is no thing you can do to maintain your salvation. There is no sin that is too far that God cannot forgive it. Because he's forgiven it all. His blood covers all or it covers none. Let 
Let me try to explain faith this way. My kids, I love my kids. They're all adults or almost an adult. They all have bank accounts. That's the key. They all have bank accounts. And sometimes they need a little bit more in their bank account. So they'll call me and say, hey, Dad, can you put some money in my account so that I can go shopping? Or can I take my friends out to eat? Or, or something like that. They need money, bottom line. Parents agree? Agree. All right. Sweet. So I will, back in the day I would have to write a check. Now we have online banking. So I just get on my phone, app, switch. Good. Put the money in there. Now, they have faith that I have done what I said I would do so they can now go to Chipotle. <laughs> Take the card, whoosh, swipe the card. Faith. They trust me, their dad, to transfer the money into their account so that they can spend the money. Guys, that's all faith is. Let me, that's as simple as I can put it. Jesus paid the debt that I couldn't pay, I couldn't afford it, and so he paid it. And so that one day when I stand before God and he says, why are you here? I can say, because Jesus paid the debt. I just heard a, a, a thing on, from Alistair Begg. He, he talks about the man on the middle cross. And the guy on the middle cross is really cool because it's, it, it deals with all the people who like, Ah, doctrine, 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 which I believe in doctrine. But it, the man on the middle cross didn't have a doctrine. He didn't have an understanding of anything. But when he stood before God, they said, why, why, why are you here? How, how do you get in? He's like, I don't know. The man on the middle cross told me I could come in. That's faith. That's it. Simple. We transfer our hope into what Jesus has done for us, not what we can do for ourselves. We trust Jesus that he accomplished what he said he would accomplish. That he did what he said he would do. We celebrate communion because of that. We celebrate next week. The culmination of communion is the resurrection because that's the seal. That's the proof that Jesus did it. Because, verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. That word, let me get in my English geek mode real quick. That word, have sinned, is in the aorist tense. Greek is aorist. The closest we have to it in the English language would be like present, present perfect tense. But aorist is even more precise because it means it's been done. We've all sinned. We have sinned. Doesn't mean that we're not going to keep sinning. Doesn't mean that it's in the past. It means that we have sinned. Because we have sinned. You're now inferior. You are not going to measure up to God's righteousness. Period. We have sinned. It's a done deal. And a holy God has to deal with that. I can't say God's holy. I better clean up my act because I've already sinned. I can't worship a holy God in hopes that I'm not going to sin because I've already sinned. It's done, and that sin has to be covered and paid for. We are inferior. We fall short, which is in the present tense. We fall short every day. We fall short. Tomorrow I will fall short because I have sinned. We cannot be what God requires us to be. But thank God for verse 24. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. It's a gift. You are just simply pronounced. When you put your faith in Jesus, you are pronounced not guilty. Not guilty. You've sinned. You're not guilty. It's a mystery. Except that Paul is doing his best to explain the mystery to us as best he can. God has to pronounce us justified. And he does this by his grace. We receive it. It's through the mercy seat. It says in other 
other versions. Through Christ redeemed us through the mercy seat. Again, Paul is pointing to the Jews when he uses the word mercy seat. The mercy seat is where they would do the sacrifice. And the mercy seat was, a, I think it was a solid gold like a seat that once the sacrifice was made and laid on the table, the mercy seat would come down and cover the sacrifice. Do you see how God has been telling his people about Jesus the entire time? If you go and read God's word, if you have a love for God's word, he will bring all of this into your brain and you'll be like, oh my gosh, it's always been Jesus. So Jesus is the mercy seat that covers us all. By his grace, I will choose, God says, I will choose you, I will call you, I will forgive you, I will pronounce you not guilty. Mankind will never invent a religion like this because mankind cannot boast in a religion like this and they cannot control in a religion like this because God is in control and that is man's greatest fear. I don't want to submit to God. I want to be God. And if I follow Jesus, I don't get to be God. If I rely on Jesus, that means I am inferior and I don't want to be inferior. This is the whole battle between Satan and God. Satan was cast out of heaven because he did not like being inferior to God. And God said, I'm God. You can't be superior because I'm God. I don't even think it was an argument. I think God was trying to wrap his mind around, what are you talking about? I can't let you be God. I'm God. It just doesn't work that way. Mankind won't invent this. Verse 25, God presented Christ as the sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. There's that word received. We receive it. We don't do anything. We just receive it. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, this is the Old Testament, his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished because Christ was going to pay for those sins. And all the people who loved God and pursued God, they knew this. They knew that a Messiah was coming to pay for those sins. In his forbearance, God presented Christ As a sacrifice, Uh, some versions say God displayed publicly. There are three words that this passage is talking about. The justification, that God has pronounced us not guilty. God is the judge, and he's the perfect judge, so he gets to pronounce not guilty. Redemption through the atonement of his blood, the shedding of blood, that's the, the redemption. And then this big word called propitiation. Propitiation, which simply means to satisfy. So you have a law, a law word, justification, we've been justified. You have a word of commerce, which is redemption, redeemed. That means it's paid for. So you've been pronounced, you've been paid for, and now we have to deal with the sin. The sin still has to be paid for. Well, Christ is the propitiation of your sin. He satisfies the wrath of God. That's our religious word. So if you want to look at it from the angle of the law, if you're a lawyer, we've been justified. If you're a money guy, you've been redeemed. If you're a religious guy, your sin's been paid for. It's covered. It's satisfied. Because God is a perfect judge. He cannot let you in without the propitiation. His wrath must be satisfied. It is satisfied on that cross that is empty because we'll celebrate next week that God rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. He overcame death. He legally dealt with our sin. He economically dealt with our sin. And he religiously dealt with our sin. That's why on the cross there are three names, or the same name, in three different languages. Hebrew, law, Greek, commerce, Aramaic, Jesus. The propitiation of our sins. And he did this to demonstrate 
Christ's righteousness. God cannot compromise his justice. Otherwise, if there's a dirty lawyer or a dirty judge, if it's ever found out every case they've ever tried gets thrown out and all those prisoners get set free. God is not a dirty judge. He is not a dirty lawyer. He's perfect. So he had to deal with the sin. He couldn't overlook the sin. He had to send his son to die for the sin. And that's why we can sing all kinds of praises. We can sing a hallelujah. Because he did everything but fail. He covered all the bases. So that... His forbearance was for the Old Testament. What about us? Verse 26, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. It's covered too. Christ paid not just for the sins of old, but for us today. So that to be just, so as to be just and one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And that's the gospel, that Christ has paid a debt we could never pay. When I was a kid, we used to go to Dawson McAllister conferences. I don't even know if you know who Dawson McAllister is. He was a Dallas-Fort Worth personality, I think. Uh, Some of you, Jonathan, you might be more familiar with Todd Proctor by chance. I don't know. He's an old worship leader. He used to lead us in worship. He was a California boy, came to North Dallas to to lead worship, and he, he taught us a song. Um, he paid a debt I, I could not pay. I owed a debt that I, that I couldn't pay. He paid a debt I couldn't pay. And I owed a debt that he didn't owe. Sorry, I said that wrong. He didn't owe a debt. He was Jesus. Now, as I wrap up here, I just want to say this as, as we wrap up. Because the issue of sinners entering hell is a big deal. The Bible doesn't really deal with hell a lot. It, it's there, and it's real. But people don't really get offended about the idea of hell. They, they'll either have the, the braggadocious attitude of, I'd rather be in hell with a bunch of sinners than in heaven with a bunch of self-righteous. You guys ever heard that? I hear it all the time. Like, oh, those church people, they're boring. Who'd want to spend eternity with them? Like, I'd rather be in hell partying because they have some idea that it's going to be fun. Or they don't have any qualms with it because they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm not perfect. I probably deserve to go to hell. People are okay with hell. What people are not okay with, what our culture, and even in churches sometimes, we don't like it. We don't like to hear that everybody can go to heaven. That is highly offensive to people who are doing their darndest to get there, right? People who want to prove that they deserve to be there cannot stand that the guy on the cross next to Jesus got to go. It is offensive. This is why Christianity is hated, guys. It's not because we preach on hell. They don't care about hell. What they care about is that we say It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. And you can take that to any extreme you want. If you put your faith in Jesus, you're justified. You're redeemed. And God's wrath has been met. It's satisfied. And that is offensive to a culture who likes to puff out their chest and say, I'm better than this person. Jesus even talked about it when he talked about the guys who went into the temple to pray. You had the sinner praying, God, I'm horrible, I'm awful, I don't deserve to be in your presence. And then you had the righteous, the self-righteous guy in there going, I'm not as bad as him. That's man's religion. That's Bob's analogy of the weights. We've been justified, we've been redeemed. And God's wrath has been satisfied. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what Christ came to do. 
So as we wrap it up, I just want you this week to contemplate that. I would beg you to memorize it. I would beg you to share it with someone else because there's so many people out there who struggle day to day that, man, I'm not good enough, Brandon. How do we live with peace? Because you've been justified. Your sin has been paid for. You don't have to keep beating yourself over the head. Your sin is covered. Now, Paul will go on to say, does this mean we should keep sinning? No. We still hold up the law. We still live according to the law because that's God's blessing. It's like a parent teaching their kids, this is how we do things so that you can have a good life. But it's not what saves you. It's not what redeems you. It's not what answers the wrath of God. That's Jesus. He's already done that. Let's pray together. Thanks for watching our Tulare First Baptist YouTube channel. But don't stop here. Hit the subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of our future videos. Also, don't forget about the TFBC app where you can stay connected because we'd sure love to see you on a Sunday morning or at any of our events. May God bless you and have a great day.